What does it measure? Seriously, tell me. Uh, the air blowing. Blowing, exactly. And what's it called when it measures the air blowing? <laughs> uh, airspeed? It's is called it? an anemometer, it's Mike. Anemometer. anemometer. <laughs> you blow through the anemometer and it tells how fast air is going. That's what you do, okay? Why are we caring about this today? I feel a little bit like a Mythbuster today. So hopefully I can say that without offending uh, any copyright or uh, holders. Um, okay, so here's what we're doing today. In X-Plane, air is kicked back from the prop over the horizontal stabilizer in the wing of the airplane. Okay, and it should be no surprise when you look at this airplane that for say a King Air with the propeller here, it kicks air back over the wing, the nacelle, and the, and the tail, and you have that prop wash in X-Plane, and X-Plane simulates this. But here's what you didn't know, perhaps. When the air hits the prop, only 50% of the acceleration has occurred. So, if the prop wash way back behind the prop is 80 knots, if there's 80 knots of prop wash, only 40 knots of that has occurred at the propeller disc itself. In other words, the air is sucked up by the prop, pressurized, pressurized by the prop, and then accelerates behind the prop due to that pressure. Did you know that? Here's the question. How long does it take for that air to accelerate up to that 80 knots? How long does it take for the air to get, when it's sucked into the prop, pressurized and spit out over how many prop diameters does the air speed up to that terminal prop wash? Well, I assume there's a formula for that. There is a formula, and I looked it up, and the formula has never been tested that I can find. The formula that I found was some people saying, well, according to our model, the thing will get to, you know, 90% of its terminal speed in four prop diameters or something like that, according to the model. But they didn't quote any experimental evidence. So here's what the curve looks like according to the model. If this is the prop disc, this is the x-axis, the airflow axis, and this axis here is v, the speed. Initially, there's like no speed, and then the air gets sucked up into the prop and sped up. It hits the prop disc at about 50% of the terminal speed. It's pressurized, and then that pressure causes the air to accelerate back behind the prop over distance. In X-Plane, it's critical that X-Plane understand how much distance it takes to accelerate so we know how much prop wash is there on the wing, how much is on the tail. And I've always been content before to use this theory, but why not do a flight test? Why not find out? So how are we gonna flight test this? But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mark some tape beside the propeller and I'm gonna mark a little distance marker every propeller diameter or every propeller radius back from the plane and I'm going to collect a little wind speed. I'm going to be back this behind the prop like this going, all right, let's get the wind speed reading. You see what I mean? And I'm going to do that at every point back behind the plane and we're going to plot this curve. Now here's what I won't do. I'm not going to do the same thing in front of the plane. The reason being, I'm willing to put myself in a region of high pressure where prop wash blows the measuring device and me away from the prop, uh, I'm not willing to put myself in an area of suction, <laughs> which pulls me and the metering equipment into the prop. Um, so is a propeller like the national debt? As in, if you can't see it, it can't hurt you. Is that <laughs> no, how a propeller? No, 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 no. It's like a Cuisinart. Yeah. That's about seven feet across and has 850 horsepower. So phones are gonna be in airplane mode. No one's allowed to text us in the middle of this experiment. Honey, you have to come pick up the kids. Okay. If you walk into the prop on the downswing, on the downswing side, it's gonna come through you. If you come onto the upswing side, oh, I don't even want to think about it's that. It's gonna start here. It's gonna work up to your body, and at oh. some point, your body will be thrown up and over the propeller. Oh. And you cannot see the prop when it's turning. The YouTube comments that are like you're being dangerous, I want to address those now. We're taping off the area, and we're briefing on this, and this has been planned by me and the flight instructor in advance. Good God! So you have to start your environmentally ruining thing first. All right, shut it down. Come on, we gotta get out of here. No, it sounds so good. 
it's fine. Okay, but we're taking my car, not your Dodge Charger. We're taking my Tesla out. And uh, I bet you my Tesla is about as fast as your Dodge Charger. We'll race someday. We'll race someday, but not today. So, all right, let's get out of here. Get in. Okay, driving our Tesla Model 3. Autopilot, engage. Autopilot, engaged. Begin anemometer test procedure. 36 miles per hour. Austin is holding his Swiffer stick with an anemometer on the end of it. Well, okay. Is this safe? No, I'm getting 15 meters per second. Is 15 meters per second 35 miles an hour? The answer know. is yes. Okay. There is some gusting wind that's uh, altering our results a little bit but uh, the anemometer was generally reading at about two miles an hour of the uh, Tesla speedometer. So I think we've got a good measuring instrument here. All right. Okay, so we're about to run our test, and let's just talk about the theory here of what's going to happen, and we're going to place a few bets as to what's going to happen. So I got my routine instrument flight instructor, Stoney, who will operate the airplane for us, and of course, Mike from X-Force PC. Not much about aerospace engineering. Which is fine. All you have to know today is don't walk into the spinny thing. That's your that's your airplane lesson for the day. Let's make sure we don't learn that lesson the hard way. Okay. Got but, it. oh no, and don't touch that after the engine run. It's super hot. That's only a couple of thousand degrees. All right, so here's the theory. The aerodynamic theory is that half of the prop wash will have occurred at the disc. In other words, if we measure, if there's 20 knots, if there's 20 knots of prop wash right at the disc, then it'll be 40 knots well behind the airplane. And the reason for that is the propeller is going to pressurize the air. It's going to whoomp, and that, that, that curved airfoil you can see here, it's going to pressurize that blade or that air. And that pressurized air will go swoop and accelerate as it goes back farther behind the airplane. And we've got uh, tape measuring the uh, distance. Every little mark on the tape is a carefully measured prop radius. We're going back to 21 prop radii behind the airplane. All right. Let's start this plane up.
Why don't you tell people who are wondering what the hell you're doing what you're doing? So we've run the test. So first of all, let me tell you the first thing I learned. It is extremely hot behind that exhaust. Yes, it is. Um, simply trying to hold this thing with my arms anywhere near that the trail of that exhaust. Remember, what was what was the in, what was the temperature? Did you notice the temperature during that run? Oh, it was only about 600 degrees. It's only about 600 Celsius. Yeah. That's uh, 1,200 Fahrenheit. The wind speed was initially uh, up close to the prop, one radius back, 92 knots. So that's what or it's 92 five, miles an hour. I'm sorry, 92 miles, miles an hour. An hour. I was in miles an hour. 92 miles an hour. Then you step back to the leading edge of the wing, which is stationed uh, about two or and a half, about two and a half uh, diameters back. It had already gone from 92 to 73. By the time we got to station five, five radii back, we were down to 56. By the time we got to six stations back, we were at about 40. At station seven, we were up to 46 because the whole thing was kind of swirling around. So the numbers are starting to vary quite a bit. It's, it's more consistent close to the prop and it starts to swirl and vary more back farther. At eight radii back, we're at 23 knots. And at nine radii back, we were at 30 knots. So in other words, the, the results are extremely high speed flow close to the prop. And as you go farther back, it kind of decelerates and swirls into turbulence. So that's what we learned. It wasn't what aerodynamic theory predicted at all. Yeah, any thoughts on that? No, it's, it's it, more common sense than aerodynamic theory. The farther away you get from a source of thrust, the less thrust you have as it departs the source of the thrust. Here's what we're going to do next. Hold that for just one sec. I'll just uh, hop up here, fire it up, we'll go for a flight, and I'll hang on tight. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any way? Uh, yeah, yeah. Duck tape me or zip tie me to the wing and let's go. <laughs> there you go. Okay, here we are. It's the next day. I've had a chance to sleep on it a little bit thinking about the data. Let's go over what we found. So, uh, there's this equation that says F equals M dot delta V. The force on the propeller is equal to the mass flow rate of air through the propeller times how much the air gets accelerated. This is, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. If one action is the force, the reaction is the mass flow rate times how much the air is sped up. It, it I've heard be that denied. one before. Yeah, exactly. F, but this theory of what the air will do has nothing to do with what actually happened, did it? What actually happened is the air had a plenty of velocity right there at the propeller. And then as we came back, the air got lower and lower. Oh, and all this is at high idle, by the way. Everything you saw was at high idle. If there was a moment in the video where, where you heard the engine kind of go and ramp up just a little bit, I don't know if you noticed that on the ramp. The engine changed its pitch a little bit in the middle of the test. I noticed that, yeah. yeah. He, that was me doing this to the instructor and telling me to go from low idle to high idle. Okay, so you heard two different power settings, but it was still all idle. We did a low idle and a high idle in the test. And I recorded data separately for each of these, okay? This is the high idle data on the left and right side of the airplane. And as you can see, it was absolutely coming down. And it goes to about half its velocity at about five or six prop radii. In other words, about two and a half or three prop diameters. At that point, the velocity is cut in half. Um, another thing that's interesting is the data was consistent, kind of consistent near the prop, but notice it starts to kind of fluctuate and break down as you get farther back. Why is that? Turbulence. Exactly. And I could feel it. When I was right up there behind the prop, it's just like this kind of you know, of, of pressure. But then as I got way back behind the prop towards the back of my airplane, it's kind of like a, you know, like when you're behind an 18 wheeler in your car and you yeah. can kind of feel that it's because it's all broken down into turbulence. And so what we're seeing is while the theory says that the air will be sucked in, pressurized, and then blown out, this red line assumes no losses. It assumes that the air is acting, or the propeller is acting as a compressor, and there's no loss in the prop wash. Now, I want to be clear about something. I explained this very good about finding the efficiency of the propeller. There's plenty of losses in the propeller and X-plane. That's all modeled. But what I didn't think to model was the losses in the prop wash. And nobody talks about that, right? Everybody's always talking about propeller efficiency. It's always, oh, I want a more efficient propeller. I got more blades. Oh, this is a four blade prop. This is a three blade prop. Oh, this one has sweat tips. You know, this one has little winglets on the tip. Everybody's always talking about propeller efficiency and X-Men works very hard to get that right. But who talks about prop wash efficiency? 
Nobody. Nobody no talks way. about prop wash efficiency because nobody cares what the prop wash does. They care what the prop does. And that's why in X-Plane, I've always worked so hard to get that prop just right, but not the prop wash. And now we're seeing that the prop wash in X-Plane, which follows this ideal theoretical curve, has almost no connection to reality. In a perfect world. Exactly. Exactly. And the perfect world is always what I've used in X-Plane for the prop wash, not for the prop, the prop wash. But now it's time to take it to the next level of realism. Well, also, you have to treat the prop wash differently now on the ground versus in the air, too. It's not whether you're on the ground or in I'm the sorry, air. I'm sorry, moving forward or stationary. Right. So we just assumed yesterday that there's no way we could get data in flight. So I just called Stoney on the phone. Here's what we're lining up. You remember when we calibrated the anemometer in the Tesla? We yeah. stuck the, can the anemometer out the window to compare it to the Tesla speed? With the Cessna 172, you can take off with the window open. So the anemometer maxes out at 100 miles an hour. Can you keep so the Cessna? So does the Cessna 172. <laughs> okay, so the Cessna um, cruises at what, right, a little over 100 maybe? Yeah, we don't have to go to cruise speed to test right. this. Just stay above stall speed. Right. So here's our next video. <laughs> We're gonna get a Cessna 172. Stony will fly in the left seat. I will sit in the right seat. I'm going to have the anemometer off the window of the Cessna 172, just like I did in the Tesla. And then the little anemometer indicator, I'm going to hold it right by the airspeed indicator. I'm going to hold it up on the panel of the airspeed indicator. You're going to be in the back seat. Your camera's going to be looking up between, and you're going to record anemometer indicator versus airspeed indicator for a takeoff. That's all within the speed range of the anemometer. True. So, um, the, so, the, so we've gotten our experimental data for the not moving case, and it had nothing to do with theory. The theory was completely wrong. The next thing is once you get moving and this whole system becomes more efficient, do you move closer to that theoretical red line? And that's the next thing we're going to find out. And then you know what I'm going to do with X-Plane? And I have X-Plane interpolate between the two based on, on the aircraft speed compared to the prop wash speed. So that's coming up next. And does wind even matter because you're measuring airspeed? An airplane moves with the wind. Right. So the wind. So if just... you're not on the ground, the airspeed doesn't. The wind right. doesn't matter. We'll the fly wind matters summer. on yeah. when you're touching the ground on and, the ground. Right. Exactly. We'll just fly this one on a non-windy day, so yeah. you don't mess up our results. That's not. Okay. Just wait till it's a non-windy day, and we'll do the flight test. I look forward to it. <laughs> It'll be fun.